art on this computer. Okay. So shall we begin? I'm going to mute everyone. Or You should be unmuted, uh, David. It says that I'm unmuted. Okay, excellent. So it's a great pleasure to have David Tong visiting our Zoominar this week. He's going to uh, tell us about um, uh, chiral boundary states for fermions. Thanks for uh, agreeing to give this seminar, David. I'll hand over okay. to you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for, for tuning in. Um, it's not quite the same as being in Dublin. I, I miss the Guinness from my, uh, my usual visits, but it's, uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to, to chat with you all anyway. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you about um, a very old subject, uh, one that's been explored uh, in depth uh, over the past three, maybe, maybe four decades. Um, and the subject is, is very straightforward. You, you have uh, fermions in one plus one dimension, uh, massless fermions in one plus one dimensions, and uh, so fermions are and you put a boundary. And you ask what kind of boundary conditions can you place uh, on, those, um, on those fermions. Um, it's a subject which, which is important in many different areas of physics. Uh, it plays an important role in defining D brains in, uh, in superstring theory and type two uh, superstrings. Um, it's mostly important in, in impurity problems. What happens if you scatter uh, fermions of impurities. Even if you're in higher dimensions, on the plane or, or in three dimensions, uh, a lot of the interest in physics is often in the S-wave scattering. And so the S-wave scattering, the S-wave comes in and S-wave goes out. It basically reduces the problem to, to fermions um, on a line, uh, interacting with, with some impurity that, that's sitting at the origin. Uh, the Kondo problem is the most famous of these examples in, in condensed matter physics. Uh, in high energy physics, uh, something called the kalan rubikov effect, um, has this, this same kind of flavor. This is the scattering of, um, of fermions of, uh, of monopoles. And um, more recently, it's become important in what's called SPT phases in, in condensed matter physics. And it's gonna be this connection to SPT phases that uh, underlies a lot of this talk. And I'll explain uh, in more detail what that means as, uh, as, as we go on. Um, what I'm gonna be particularly interested in is uh, boundary conditions that preserve chiral symmetries. So let, let me uh, give you a sense for, for what that means. Uh, you have massless fermions on the line. Uh, massless fermions have to travel at the speed of light, but that means they either go, uh, I'm gonna get confused with the zoom mirror, um, go right or, or they go left. Um, what I want is situations where the charges carried by the right moving fermions are different from the charges Carry, carried by the left moving fermions. And nonetheless, that symmetry is preserved when you, when you hit a boundary. So let, let me give you a, an example that will be useful just to have in your mind. Um, consider two Dirac fermions, two complex fermions on the line. And I want to preserve a U1 symmetry where the fermions going that way have charges three and four, respectively. And the charges, fermions going that way have charges five and zero. And I want to put some boundary condition here that preserves that that you want symmetry. Okay. Um, you might be forgiven for thinking that this is impossible. Uh, it sort of smells naively like it's, it's difficult. You can just ask yourself the following simple question. Um, what happens if I throw in a fermion of charge three? What, what's gonna bounce back? I've only got fermions of charge five and, and zero. It looks like there's no option for, for anything to bounce back. And um, if you uh, try to impose boundary conditions at the level of fields in the Lagrangian, which is the way one usually imposes boundary conditions, you, you'll indeed find it's, it's not possible to, to impose these kind of boundary conditions. Nonetheless, um, there are ways to do it. Uh, the simplest way to do it, or at least um, the most intuitive way to do it, is to add extra degrees of freedom on the boundary. So for example, uh, you could add little rotor degrees of freedom, quantum mechanical rotors, which, which live on the boundary, and the quantum mechanical rotors will have the, um, the property that, that when they spin, they, they carry charge. So some fermion comes in and it interacts with this rotor, typically in some complicated, strongly interacting way, and, and spits out another fermion. And in this way, you can, 
you, you can preserve, uh, preserve the change. Now, um, there's lots of different ways to cook up these uh, internal degrees of freedom. However, if you look at very low energies, um, lower than any interaction scale that, that may be there on the boundary, there's actually a universal um, construction of these boundary conditions. And the universal construction uses conformal field theory. Uh, in fact, it uses a version uh, called boundary conformal field theory that was first introduced by uh, Cardi in, in the 1980s. And uh, it's this construction of these bound, what are called boundary states, I'll, I'll explain as, um, as the talk goes on. It's this construction that I'd like to, to explore a little bit and just to study some of the properties of these, of these boundary conditions. So that's where we're going in the talk. I'm gonna tell you a few of the, the properties that these uh, slightly curious boundary conditions have. Um, I, I should stress at the beginning, uh, these chiral boundary conditions aren't new. Um, the first place I found them in the literature is about 1998, I think, in the context of, of D-brains in string theory. They, they were written down by uh, Schumerus and Recknagel. I'd be amazed if they weren't there earlier. Um, more recently, they've been discussed in the context of SPT phases by Shinsei Ryu and uh, collaborators in a, in a number of papers. So the states themselves aren't new, the conditions aren't new, uh, but the properties I'm going to tell you, uh, as far as I'm aware, are new. All right, so that, that's um, where we're going. Um, but before I show you some slides, let me just t tell you why, why I care about this. Um, there's actually a, a circle of ideas um, that, that, that motivates this. One very basic question, which, which um, I, I'm intrigued by, partly because it's a question where I thought I knew the answer for 20 years, and recently I've been told that I don't know the answer. Um, the question is the following. Uh, take massless fermions and give them a mass, so gap them in the condensed matter language. Um, what symmetries are broken when you gap uh, massless fermions? If you give them a mass uh, a weak coupling, just by writing down a quadratic term in the Lagrangian, then it's very clear what symmetries are broken. If you're in even dimensions, you, you break chiral symmetries or axial symmetries. If you're in odd dimensions, you break things like parity or, or, or time rivers. Um, one of the things that, that I've learned, and I think actually the community has, has learned over the past five to 10 years, um, is that if you give them a mass through strong coupling effects, not, not just by writing down a quadratic term in the, in the Lagrangian, but by some kind of interactions, those statements are not necessarily true. And it's possible um, to give masses to fermions um, whenever the fermions do, when, let me start that sentence again, I got, I got a bit confused. It's possible to give masses to fermions, preserving symmetries, providing those symmetries do not have an anomaly, or what's now these days usually called a Tofta anomaly. Um, by the way, that's why I picked the example three, four and five, zero. It's because three squared plus four squared is equal to five squared plus zero squared. And the fact that they cancel is the requirement that uh, um, there's no anomaly for, for that particular symmetry in, in two dimensions. So now if you were to ask condensed matter uh, colleagues, I think they would say that the folklore is that you can give fermions a mass preserving any symmetry, provided that that symmetry is not anomalous. That's a very striking statement. Um, for example, in the standard model, uh, the suggestion is that you might be able to give all the fermions a mass without breaking electroweak gauge symmetry. Um, I, I remind you that the successful prediction of the Higgs boson came because we thought that wasn't possible. And yet now various ideas from condensed matter physics suggest that, that you know, there's more interesting ways to do things that, that we haven't fully understood. So this is the, the collection of um, ideas that, that I'm interested in. Um, the, the question of how you give fermions a mass is quite a difficult one. It turns out the question of how you give boundary conditions to fermions is easier, but closely related. And the reason it's related is the following. Consider the line and turn on a mass term only on one half of space. And any massless fermions that, that come from this region don't have the energy to enter into the gapped region, so have to bounce off. And if you can give mass to fermions preserving a symmetry, you have to be able to give boundary conditions to fermions preserving the same symmetry. So the goal is um, firstly to start with one plus one dimensions, because it's easy as always, um, and to use the boundary conditions as a, as a way to get a handle on when you can give fermions a mass. And ultimately the goal is to understand this in, in higher dimensions. Um, so that was the motivation. It's sort of a long-term project, but, but hopefully what I have to tell you about um, uh, one plus one dimensions is, is going to be interesting in and of itself. Um, 
that's a fairly long introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll share some slides now. Are there any questions before I um, kick off and show you things? I don't see any. I think you can continue. Okay, all happy. Um, let me. Um, okay. Can people see the slides? Y yes. Okay. Yeah, very good. Um, so uh, this is, um, I think I might. All oh, right, that's a bit better. Now we're yeah. off the screen. Um, this is uh, work that's contained in uh, a series of papers with my um, amazingly fantastic student, uh, Philip Boyle Smith. Um, I, I should stress that almost everything I'm about to tell you is, is due to Philip and, and, and not me. Um, in particular, to do this project, uh, Philip first learned boundary conformal field theory, and then Philip had to teach me boundary conformal field theory. Uh, in return, um, I'm not going to teach you boundary conformal field theory. Uh, the subject is rather technical. Under the hood in this talk, it's all about boundary conformal field theory, but it turns out the results are very easy to state and the proofs are very, very long and, and, and well, sometimes Philip's proofs were beautifully elegant, sometimes they were just a mess. But um, I'm going to hide all the proofs and just tell you the, um, the statements of, of what's coming. So this is uh, what we have ahead of us. Um, I'm going to start off by telling you um, about a very simple anomaly in quantum mechanics, possibly even the simplest anomaly uh, in, in quantum field theories. It's what's called a mod two anomaly. And I'll explain how this mod two anomaly um, is related to, to boundary conditions. Um, I'll then tell you about these boundary states. And then the main part of the talk is to tell you about RG flows between different boundary states. Um, and then I'm gonna finish with one or maybe two quick um, quick comments. There's a rather cute Z8 classification of um, uh, uh, what's called SPT phases that goes back to, to now famous work by Fidkowski and Kitaev from uh, maybe about 10 years ago. Um, and then I want to finish, if I have time, with an open problem um, uh, about monopoles in, in four-dimensional chiral gauge theory. It's a problem that I've been obsessed with for some years now that, that has not been solved. All right, so, so that, that's where we're going. And please just, just feel free to jump in on the chat or, or unmute yourselves and, and ask questions at, at any time. All right, let me start by telling you um, about what's now called the mod two anomaly. Um, it's the simplest example of a quantum field theory that doesn't make any sense. That's what it means to have a, an anomalous quantum field theory. In fact, it's so simple, it's not quantum field theory, it's just quantum mechanics. And uh, the quantum system that I claim doesn't make any sense is the following. In quantum mechanics, you take a single real fermion. So a single Majorana fermion uh, in quantum mechanics. Um, that is a system which um, is, uh, is inconsistent. And to explain why it's inconsistent, we, we can do the following. Um, start by taking two Majorana fermions. Two, two Majorana fermions or a complex fermion completely fine, uh, no problem at all. Um, if you have two Majorana fermions, or one Dirac fermion, um, it acts on a Hilbert space of dimension two. There's various ways of, uh, of thinking about this. Uh, the two states are um, no fermion or yes fermion, uh, fermion unoccupied or, or fermion occupied. Um, alternatively, if you think about the two real uh, Majorana fermions, call them lambda one and lambda two, then uh, the anti-commutation relations form a Clifford algebra uh, that you can see here. The Clifford algebra in two dimensions has an irreducible representation of dimension two. That's two Majorana fermions. Um, however, one Majorana fermion, um, uh, using various tensor um, product assumptions, therefore has to act irreducibly on a Hilbert space of dimension the square root of two. But there's no such thing as a Hilbert space of the dimension square root of two. Uh, what this is telling you is that a single Majorana fermion is not consistent in quantum mechanics. Um, th there's actually a more direct calculation that, that you can do to see this. You can um, compute the partition function of a single Majorana fermion using the path integral. Um, if you put anti-periodic boundary conditions uh, on time, make time a circle and put anti-periodic boundary conditions, um, computing the path integral will compute the dimension of the Hilbert space, uh, trace of one basically. Um, if you do that calculation using the path integral, you use zeta function regularization, you get this result at the top here, that the dimension of the Hilbert space is the square root of two. Doesn't make sense. All right, so, so this is an example of a, an inconsistent 
quantum system. Um, this square root of two is going to be a little bit of a, a recurring motif as, as we, we go through the talk. Whenever we see a square root of two, it's always going to tell us that there's a, a hidden inconsistency, or, or perhaps more likely an inconsistency that we've had to resolve through, uh, through some other method. All right, that, that's in quantum mechanics. It, it turns out this same um, mod two anomaly, it's a mod two anomaly because odd numbers of Meyer on a fermions don't make sense, but even numbers do make sense. Um, this same kind of mod two anomaly also rears its head um, if you think about fermions on a line, uh, but, but with a boundary. And um, there's a various ways to see this, and I'll, I'll walk you through a few of them. Um, the simplest thing to do is to start with a Majorana fermion in one plus one dimensions. Nothing wrong with a Majorana fermion in one plus one dimension. Um, give it a mass and then um, uh, put it on a manifold with a boundary. Um, you have two possible choices for um, the boundary conditions that, that you can put there. The left moving fermion has to turn into a right moving fermion, but it can turn into a right moving fermion with one of two signs, either plus or minus. So um, if you now solve the Dirac equation, seem to have uh, gone out of, oh no, maybe it's good. Um, if you now solve the Dirac equation uh, for the massive fermion subject to those boundary conditions, uh, you'll find a solution, which is the same kind of solution that Jakeev and Rebbe were working with in the 1970s in the context of soliton physics. Here it's just a boundary. Um, the solution is a zero mode, and it's a zero mode with this characteristic exponential factor. Um, and depending on the sign of the mass, m, and the sign of the, the boundary condition, um, as you go into the, the physical part of the space, the zero mode either decays or, or it grows. Um, if it decays, you have a normalizable Majorana zero mode. But that's precisely the kind of system that we've just uh, said is inconsistent. In other words, um, if you just have a single boundary um, with uh, a normalizable zero mode, you have a quantum mechanical Majorana mode stuck on the boundary, and it's an inconsistent boundary condition. So the anomaly in quantum mechanics rears its head in um, the kind of boundary conditions that, uh, that you can add for fermions. But by the way, as always with anomalies, there's ways to resolve them. Um, and so it turns out you are allowed these boundary conditions, but you have to do something else to make sure that, that they're acceptable. And I'll get to that in, in a couple of slides. All right, I should say that this, um, uh, these kind of ideas really date back to, to the work of Kitaev on what's now called the Majorana chain at um, uh, the turn of the century. Um, but there's a, a very nice paper by Digraph and Witten from a couple of years ago that really elaborates um, on this point in, in, in the way that um, I'm explaining it here. All right, that's a massive Majorana fermion. What about um, uh, a Dirac fermion? So a Dirac fermion in one plus one dimensions. Um, you can build from two Majorana fermions. And um, again, there's two different choices of, of boundary conditions that, that we consider. We can consider um, the boundary condition that preserves the U1 vector symmetry of, of the fermion. The left moving fermion turns into the right moving fermion. Um, if you uh, write this in terms of the two Majoranas, you'll find that the two Majorana fermions both obey the same boundary condition. In other words, in terms of zero modes, there are either two Majorana zero modes, or there are no Majorana zero modes, because both chi-1 and chi-2 obey the same boundary condition. Either way, um, you have an even number of Majorana zero modes, everything is fine. In contrast, another boundary condition you can put on um, is a left-moving fermion comes in and um, turns into the conjugate fermion going the other way. Uh, these are boundary conditions that um, actually are applicable in, in, in real world situations. Um, if you take a wire, which just has normal electrons, um, and you attach it to a superconductor, um, the charge in a superconductor is only conserved mod two because of, a, um, because of the, the Cooper pair condensate. Um, so if you attach a wire to a superconductor and you send in an electron, a hole will bounce back. It's, it's what's called Andre of reflection, and uh, it's modeled by exactly these, these kind of boundary conditions. Now, um, for these kind of boundary conditions, you can convince yourself, if you write them in terms of the two Majoranas, one Majorana has one kind of boundary condition with, a, say, a plus sign, and the other Majorana has a, the other kind of boundary condition with a minus sign. Uh, in, in other words, these Andreev um, boundary conditions are guaranteed to give you just one 
Majorana zero mode. And as I've mentioned, Majorana zero modes are inconsistent. So if you put boundary conditions of, of this kind, like you have some work to do to understand how it can possibly be that you have a single Majorana zero mode uh, in the system. All right. Um, on these two slides, I've talked about massive fermions. Uh, the reason to talk about massive fermions is because it makes it very clear that you get these localized zero modes and connects um, the zero modes to the, to the quantum mechanical anomaly. Um, but anomalies in, in quantum field theory are always independent of the mass. So for these two slides, the mass was really just a crutch to make it clear where this mod two anomaly was, um, uh, was coming from. For the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about massless fermions, but the um, issues that I've dealt with here still, still remain. Um, massless fermions also have um, possibly dangling Majorana modes at the end. If they have Majorana modes, you have to do something about them because a single Majorana mode is, is inconsistent. All right. Um, so what can you do about it? Suppose you have one Majorana mode. Um, obviously, Andreev reflection actually happens in laboratory experiments, so there has to be some way, um, say, some way around it. Um, how can you make the theory consistent? Well, uh, there's a bunch of different, different options. Um, one is the following. You could put the system on an interval. So now you have two boundary conditions, one on this end and, and one on this end. Uh, if you have a single Majorana mode on this end, uh, you can have another Majorana mode on this end, and then you've got a pair of Majorana modes uh, in total, and the theory is consistent. So the Majorana modes don't have to be in the same place in space. They can be delocalized in space, and the anomaly uh, goes away. Um, what it means, however, is that the boundary conditions, um, well, they go into two classes, the, uh, the normal or the Andreev. And if you have the system on an interval, you could put um, you know, one from um, the normal on both ends or the Andreev on both ends, but you can't put one on one end and the other on the other. So now there's the problem transmutes into the fact that certain boundary conditions are mutually inconsistent. You can't put normal boundary conditions here and Andreev. Here, you have to put the same on, on both. Okay, that's one possibility. Um, another possibility, which is kind of um, a little boring, is you could just add an extra Majorana mode by hand. The quantum field theory doesn't do it for you, but you could just say by hand, I'm gonna add a Majorana mode, um, one to add with the zero mode that I get so that um, the whole thing is consistent uh, uh, overall. Finally, there's a rather subtle way um, uh, to cancel the anomaly th through um, something called anomaly inflow. Um, it was a, a subject first discussed in the context of solitons by Callan and Harvey uh, long ago. It turns out there's a very interesting topological field theory in one plus one dimensions. Um, the topological field theory has a partition function um, which is minus one to the half invariant of the Riemann surface on which um, your fermions live. Um, the half invariant is an invariant to do with uh, spin structures, um, which, which I it's not going to be relevant actually for, for this talk, so I'll, I'll, I'll just move on. Um, but there is a, um, uh, a way to have a topological field theory where if you have a topological field theory with, on a manifold with boundary, the topological field theories um, donates one Majorana mode to the boundary and you're obliged to have another one. Uh, there. But by the way, if there are string theorists in the audience, um, th there's a lovely paper um, from last year by Tachi Kawa and friends, which, which was, um, fleshing out some ideas in a talk by Witten from, from a couple of years ago. Uh, a lot of the properties of D brains in type two string theory um, and indeed type one string theory can be understood in terms of half invariance on the world sheet of the D brain um, and uh, the fact that hidden was a topological field theory living on, sorry, I misspoke, a topological field theory of the half invariant living on the world sheet of the string. And the fact, for example, that in type two A, you only have D zero, D two, D four, and um, uh, even spatial world volume D brains, whereas in type 2B you have the others, but in between there are non-BPS D brains that, that Ashok Sen found some years ago. Uh, this whole story has a very lovely interpretation in terms of um, topological facts to do with uh, this mod 2 anomaly. So again, not really relevant for the talk, but I thought I'd just advertise um, this beautiful work here. All right, so this mod 2 anomaly is um, going to be important as we, as we uh, move through the talk. Um, However, this is a very good time to stop and ask for questions before I move on to discuss other issues. Any questions? I'm just a 
probably slightly aside, I know the Arfin variant in the context of um, dimer models and it, it's related to imposing positivity on a partition function. Is there some implication of positivity for in this setting? How, how is that? Because it's, 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 it's minus one to the, to the half and, and, and you want to fix up a minus sign and you do it with an half, is that, is that the way it works? Exactly, yes, exactly. That, it does, that does sound very, very similar to, um, to what's going on. I didn't know about that, that application of the half and vary. Um, yeah, it, it, it sounds related, doesn't it? Although there, yeah. yeah, it does, yeah. And, and it's, why do you want a positive partition function? Usually it can be any complex number. Well, it could be, but the uh, the dimer model has positive weights, and it just it's essentially defined as the um, as just fugacities on a on some lattice, and it, in an old uh, result of Castellan's, he showed that it was equivalent to a a, fermion, a fermionic Dirac operator, where with minus mm. signs. When you put that on a Riemann surface, you, you the the requirement of that positivity, it it essentially counts the number of uh, of pairings, I mean, perfect matchings that, of the lattice. Yeah, the that's lattice exactly case. right. It's it's the motto it, index of the of the Chiral Dirac operator on, on the Riemann surface. You, you exactly. know the, the the simplest place it arises is take a single Majorana fermion in one plus one dimensions um, and give it a mass. Uh, the mass can be either positive or negative. Um, Kitaev in this work from, from 2000 showed that you should think of them as two different phases depending if the mass is, is positive or negative. Um, one phase, the partition function is one, it's the trivial phase, but if the mass is negative, um, the partition function is minus one to the half invariant, and that's the topological field theory. Um, it, do, it does sound like okay. that's very much in the same ballpark as your Dimer model. Um, yeah, I don't know the exact connection. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Can I ask a question, David? Yeah, Brian, please. Um, for the standard model um, with right-handed neutrinos, Shaposhnikov has been pushing models with sterile right-handed neutrinos. Um, and you can introduce um, an arbitrary number, I think, but he needs two to fit cosmological data. Um, but if you introduced a, a completely sterile right-handed neutrino for each generation, you'd have three. Mm -hmm. Is there a suggestion that if you try to put the standard model in a box or something, that might be inconsistent? No. In, in fact, the, the story... So firstly, I'm only talking about quantum mechanical Majorana modes here. A single Majorana fermion in, in 1 plus 1, 2 plus 1, or 3 plus 1 is perfectly fine. It's, ah, okay. it's the zero modes um, uh, uh, that are problematic, the, the quantum mechanical Majoranas. Um, and also, I should stress, they're really only problematic on compact spaces. That There's a sense in which you know, I, I said you could have a system on an interval with a Majorana here and a Majorana here, and, and that, that's perfectly consistent. If I, if I take this off camera and make it a non-compact half line, then somehow a Majorana at infinity is, uh, is also allowed. Um, however, um, as you brought it up, there is an, an analogous story um, related to the fact that you can do special things in three plus one dimensions um, when you have 16 fermions. Um, and notably, when you add a right-handed neutrino, each generation has exactly 16 uh, right-handed fermions. So I think there is um, a relationship to what, between the need for a right-handed um, neutrino and certain beautiful things to do with anomalies. Um, ultimately, that's one of the reasons I was actually doing this project. Um, but, but I don't think there's a direct connection. And certainly, there's no problem with, um, with three. By the way, I thought cosmological data needed them all to have very heavy mass, and the, the BBN constraints are three. G equals two point eight for the, which is cosmology speak for three, um, for uh, the degrees of freedom during BBN. That, that was my recollection. Um, well, I mean, I, I, my, Shapovalov claims he's a model with two um, that, that is that, that fits the data, um, but I, I don't remember the details. Um, I mean, I think he's using seesaw mechanisms and. It's right. probably very heavy and very light. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Okay. All this should be related to uh, self-adjoint operator. The Dirac operator is governed by a certain elliptic operator. And it should be related, all this should be related to 
whether that operator is self-adjoint or the chosen boundary conditions. I think the boundary it's conditions that I've picked are self-adjoint for, for both. Then it should be, self, then one, it has a complete set of states, orthogonal and so on. So one can quantize in the standard way. For example, APS boundary conditions give the zero modes. The standard Athiya Patodi singer boundary conditions give the zero modes at one edge. That you're no, you're, 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 you're absolutely right, they do. Um, but nonetheless, the, the system, if you take the system, let's take a Riemann surface, Euclidean Riemann surface with a single boundary, um, and you put um, the APS boundary conditions, both of these have an APS uh, interpretation. Let's do a single Majorana. Both of these have a, sorry, I think APS is for Dirac rather than uh, Majorana, but I think the story holds for both. But both of them have well-defined um, boundary conditions. The Dirac operator, um, yeah, the, nonetheless, the quantum system is, is inconsistent. Um, I'm trying to think how it, how it arises in this, this system. The, the operator has, has a real structure. So it allows a, uh, some operation like time reversal or complex conjugation. Then one knows from general theory that the, it always allows self-adjoint extensions because the deficiency indices are equal. Okay? The complex conjugation pays the uh, plus i and minus i eigenvalues. What I'm not clearly understanding is why quantum field theory gives trouble. Whereas in quantum mechanics, there is no problem. Maybe, I, I, maybe Ooh. it is real. Paul, but adding self adjoint extensions is very close to adding additional degrees of freedom maybe on the boundary. The they may not propagate. They may just see this. It may just be a boundary yeah. condition. It's a boundary, but you're adding additional degrees of freedom in a self adjoint extension on the boundary. If you think of it, of it you're often adding something to make itself a joint, you put a delta function on the boundary, and you can see it in the action by integrating by parts. It's, it's not present in one form, whereas when you integrate by parts, you see it shows up as a delta function. So you see you've added new degrees of freedom on the, purely on the boundary. So take a particle on a circle. Uh, if you make a quasi-periodic boundary condition for a particle on a circle, you get an angle theta, this C, the standard the and angle. And the angle. Huh. Uh, suppose, so the wave function is not periodic, but quasi-periodic. It changes by a phase. Sure. That phase is related to the standard uh, phase that occurs in QCD in 3 plus 1. Okay? It's the theta that's angle. That's right. It's just a pi flux through the middle of the circle. Sorry? Not the middle. Uh, it corresponds to a flux in the middle of the circle. Yes. So that one gives a parity anomaly or time reversal anomaly. But the quantum mechanics is completely consistent. There is nothing wrong. That, that's right. That's an anomaly in a, in, in a series. So people, you know, there's way too many meanings of the word, of the word anomaly. If I go back to this, this first slide, this, this anomaly isn't, it's closer to a, what, what we would call a gauge anomaly. Um, though obviously there's no gauge symmetry here, but it's an inconsistent theory, just having a single Majorana fermion in, in quantum mechanics. If you try and do canonical quantization, you can add things to, to make it work in canonical quantization, but adding things typically means you end up with two Majorana fermions or a single complex fermion. So the, the anomaly here is an inconsistency. If you end up in a quantum field theory in a compact space, so there's nothing going on at infinity, with an odd number of Majorana zero modes. May I just ask, if I take a single Majorana fermion? Yes. To be sure about my mathematics, let me smear it to this function. Okay? So, sorry, I, I didn't quite hear the last part. Could you say that again? Okay. Smear it with compactly supported space time test functions. Okay? Oh, we're doing quantum mechanics now, so just time so, test functions. Uh, uh, I, I just want to look at quantum field theory. What may go wrong? What I have, what I have read is that if you smear it like that, it is simply that my error and Fermi are smeared with the test function is actually a unitary operator because of the uh, Clifford algebra. So it is simply a theory of a unitary matrix okay, in space time, which you want to quantize. So a priori, I don't see any inconsistency. Uh, I don't fully understand what is the relation to, uh, to domains of operators. There should be one. 
Yeah, I, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can add anything without, without just repeating myself, but a Majorana fermion in, in a compact closed manifold um, in higher dimensions, perfectly consistent. But the question is how, how you impose boundary conditions and you have to be careful to impose boundary conditions so that you only get an even number of Majorana zero modes. If it's massive, if it's, if it's massless, there, the problem rises in slightly different ways. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, one uh, question in the, in the same line. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the way uh, physics uh, allows uh, Andrea uh, reflection uh, from uh, what Bal and, and you have just said, I would expect uh, that uh, you, you get uh, some boundary excitation. So is, is that uh, okay experimentally or how, how what's the physical effect uh, to make it? It's a great it? question and I'm afraid I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, I think that the, the two possibilities are that there's a Majorana fermion on the other end of the lead. Um, actually, that, that can't possibly be, be what happens because that would be way too exciting to, to have uh, two Majoranas that you know, all of these people trying to build topological quantum computers are trying to do exactly that. So it, it must be that somehow there's another Majorana mode and you have a qubit that, that's sitting there on the, um, on the interface. Whether or not that has any experimental implications, I, I don't know, I'm afraid. Thank you. That's a great question. I'd, I'd love to know the answer. Okay. Other questions? All right, so that, that was a single Majorana fermion, um, or sorry, or a single Dirac fermion. Um, what I'd like to talk about here is what happens when you have multiple fermions. So we'll have, uh, in general, um, a whole bunch of Majorana fermions. And now the possibilities for boundary conditions is, is, is much larger, as, as we'll see. So um, the situation I'm going to be interested in is having 2n massless now. We, we, everything's going to be massless for the rest of the talk. Um, 2n massless Majoranas, or equivalently, you compare them up to make n Dirac uh, fermions, again, on the line in, in, in 1 plus 1 dimensions. And uh, the question I want to ask, uh, the general question is, is what boundary conditions can you place um, on these 2n fermions, and what symmetries can be preserved by those, those boundary conditions? Um, I don't know, I don't think that the answer has been proven, but there's a folklore. And the folklore is you can impose a symmetry, so you can impose a boundary condition for any symmetry which does not suffer a Toft denominator. Now, um, I certainly know of examples of symmetries, non abelian symmetries that don't suffer Toft anomalies, where the boundary conditions are just not known. And if I have time, I'll, I'll explain some at the end of the talk. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be discussing only abelian symmetries. And in that case, we can construct the boundary conditions. Um, and an example of an abelian symmetry, um, which doesn't have an anomaly, is where the left moving fermions have a bunch of charges QI, and the right moving fermions have a bunch of charges Q bar I, where I goes from one to N over the fermions, and the sum of the squares of the left moving fermions is equal to the sum of the squares of the right moving fermions. This is the condition for anomaly cancellation in, um, uh, um, in one plus one dimensions. Uh, notice there's no gauge fields in the game. So the, these are global anomalies uh, or the lack of global um, uh, anomalies um, in the system. What, what, what's these days often called a Toft anomaly. All right. Um, the kind of boundary conditions that I'm interested in, the, these chiral ones, I, I mentioned at the beginning, you can't just impose some condition on the fermion field, like left moving fermion equals right moving. That clearly just doesn't preserve the kind of um, charges that we want. Um, instead, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you could add uh, interacting degrees of freedom on the boundary, but at very low energies, um, we can use the technology of boundary conformal field theory. So I'll, I'll just very briefly tell you what boundary conformal field theory is, but then everything else I'm gonna sweep under the hood, apart from one short slide in, uh, uh, in a couple of minutes time. So the idea is the following, you, you have your quantum system and you want to put it on an interval. And you put different boundary conditions on the two ends. Boundary condition that I'll call A here, a boundary condition that I've called B here. And you want to compute the partition function of this, this quantum system subject to these, these boundary conditions. So you can pactify time, you can pick periodic, anti-periodic, it's, it, it's up to you, um, and compute the partition function. Uh, the idea of Cardi from uh, the late um, 80s is that life gets easier if you do a modular transformation, which is what string theory is called open closed string duality. And the modular transformation basically rotates your picture by, by 90 degrees. Um, that means that what was time, moving around the blue circle, becomes space. 
And so there's a new Hilbert space and states defined um, uh, around the circumference of this cylinder. In contrast, what was space becomes a, a temporal direction um, uh, up here. So the two boundary conditions that you had A and B now become states in a Hilbert space, uh, a state A and a state, state B. These states are called boundary states. Um, they have to obey certain conditions that, that Cardi and subsequently Cardi and, and Llewellyn um, wrote down. Um, but everything about the boundary conditions is now captured in a, in a, a state in a, in a particular Hilbert space. Um, and you can extract a lot of information from, from these states and I'll tell you some of the things you can extract uh, as we go on. All right, so what do I actually want to do? Um, uh, we have two n Majorana fermions or equivalently n Dirac fermions. And I'm going to preserve um, the maximal symmetry I can. I'm going to preserve a U1 to the N symmetry. Uh, the left moving fermions are gonna have charges Q and the right moving fermions are gonna have charges Q bar. Um, the I goes over one to N and labels the fermion and the alpha goes over one to N and labels the um, U1 symmetry. And there can't be any anomalies, not only between the U1s themselves, but there can't be any anomalies between one U1 and another U1. In other words, these Q and Q bars should satisfy the following N squared conditions uh, on the charges. It's very similar to what we had before. The sum over left moving charges squared is equal to the sum over right moving charges squared, but where the alpha and beta labeling the different U1s are, uh, are left floating in this equation to guarantee there's no mixed anomalies between any, any choice of U1s. So that's my setup. I pick um, uh, a bunch of Qs and a bunch of Q bars. We can look at some examples later. It turns out that everything, um, all the results uh, don't actually depend on Q and Q bar individually, but they just depend on this following um, rational orthogonal matrix. I should say that the Qs and Q bars are integers. They're charges of under U1, so they're integers, not irrational numbers. Um, that means that uh, if I compute the matrix R, which is inverse Q bar times Q, uh, this is a rational matrix and using that anomaly cancellation condition from the previous slide, it turns out this is an orthogonal matrix as well. Um, to give you some simple examples, the, the basic boundary conditions that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, where left movers turn into right movers, gives uh, this matrix R is equal to one. Um, the Andreev scattering for every fermion uh, gives R is equal to, to minus one. In general, however, Q and Q bar are gonna be different and R is going to be some more interesting uh, rational orthogonal matrix. Um, in fact, uh, all of the conditions are really expressed in terms of the following uh, charge lattice. So um, I'll spend a little time giving you some intuition for what, what this, this charge lattice is, because um, everything we'll, we'll see will we'll rely on this. Um, start with the lattice Z to the N. Um, you should think of this as, um, uh, the possibilities for fermions just to carry charges 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on. That, that, that's this z to the n. Pick a point in the lattice z to the n and act on it with this rotation matrix R. So it goes to another, uh, another point. The question is, when you act on it with R, does it hit another point in the lattice or does it sit somewhere in between the points on the lattice? If the point you start with gets rotated and hits another point on the lattice, keep it. And if it doesn't hit another point on the lattice, discard it. What's left are the points which form a new lattice, um, which I'm gonna call lambda, okay? Uh, the intuition behind this is, is the following. If um, we have simple boundary conditions where left movers turn into right movers with the same charge, R is one, and this lattice lambda is all of Z to the N. However, if the left movers differ wildly from the right movers, then Q and Q bar, are very different. Um, R is an orthogonal matrix typically with um, uh, a large number in the denominator of the various terms. And that means that if you look close to the origin, most of the things you rotate, rotate just a little bit and don't come back to Z to the N. But because it's a rational uh, rotation matrix, if you go far enough out, uh, you'll find a point where you rotate it and it does indeed come back to Z to the N. In other words, what's going on here is, is the bigger the difference between left moving and right moving charges, the sparser this, this lattice, uh, lambda to the r. So that, that's the intuition we should have. All right, this lambda to the r is gonna be every, everywhere for the next few slides. So are there any questions about um, how this is defined? <laughs> 
what is the if we go on applying r again and again does it close necessarily um yes uh, eventually it may not it, it may not come round after one back to itself but because it's 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 rational if you go around enough times you'll you'll come back up to itself just just pick the look at all the denominators pick pick the largest yeah, multiply them all together and then that, that number of times and you're, you're guaranteed to come back to yourself. So R to the power of N for some N is one? Uh, yeah, apart from N is not the same N that I'm using. So R to the power of some integer. Yeah. Okay. Why should Q bar be invertible? Oh, that, um, yes, that actually follows from the requirement, the dual requirement of the fact that I have a, U, a genuine U1 to the N symmetry rather than a fake U1 to the N minus one symmetry where things don't act on some of the fermions and um, and this Toft anomaly cancellation condition. Okay. Okay, other questions? All right, um, this slide is for people that know boundary conformal field theory. If you don't know it, don't, don't worry. Um, I, I told you that there's a, um, a state associated with this boundary condition. This is the state. Um, I'll walk you through a bunch of different things. Um, the, the strange double bra uh, bracket, just double bracket bra notation here is uh, what's called an Ishibashi state. Uh, it's a coherent uh, type state um, labeled by uh, lambda and lambda bar. These are roughly speaking a left moving and right moving charges for both the fermion. Uh, the state is constructed so that um, no current is flowing into, into the state. That, that's the physical meaning of this. Um, the boundary states are then some linear combination over the, these Ishibashi states. Um, there's a bunch of uh, features here, very few of which are going to be important. There's a super annoying phase factor, um, which, although I said these states have been discussed um, many times over the years, I think everybody missed this phase factor and it was actually important for some of our work. So if we've added one thing to these states, it's it's this, it's, it's super annoying and it's buried in an appendix of one of our papers and it took ages to get right, um, but it's, it's not important for this talk. Um, if you fix the charges, the Qs and Q bars, or equivalently the R matrix, um, the state is not unique. The state depends on a bunch of uh, phases, theta. Um, again, these phases are not actually going to be important um, uh, throughout this talk. If you know about D brains, uh, thetas just translate having bosonized fermions into, into dual compact bosons, theta just translate into positions of D brains on the torus or Wilson lines are around the torus. So there's something very familiar, at least uh, from a D brain language. The crucial thing for this talk is, is what sits in front. So unlike normal states in quantum mechanics, um, where they're obliged to be you know, normalized to one, or said another way, it's projective rays that, that are interesting. Um, the boundary states, the normalization matters. The normalization is really crucial for boundary states. Uh, it's fixed by things called Cardi conditions, um, which I, I, I won't mention. Um, but this normalization factor that I'm gonna call G has a very important interpretation, uh, as I'll, I'll now explain. Um, the top interpretation was first pointed out by Affleck and Ludwig in, in 91. And um, one way of saying it is that, um, a bird almost flew into my kitchen. Um, one way of saying it is that, um, uh, if you compute the partition function um, of the system on a cylinder, there's a contribution from the boundary. And the contribution from the boundary is proportional to this um, uh, factor uh, G. Um, roughly speaking, you, you should think of it in the following way. But remember I said that if, if you want to write down a Lagrangian that, that reflects left movers into right movers preserving chiral symmetries, um, you have to put little degrees of freedom on the boundary, things that soak up the charge. Um, this boundary central charge G is somehow capturing the number of degrees of freedom you needed to put on the boundary um, in order to do the job that, that, that you needed to do. So it's very similar to a central charge in normal conformal field theory. It somehow captures the number of degrees of freedom, um, but it's capturing the number of degrees of freedom on the boundary of this, uh, um, uh, this boundary conformal field theory. So we can ask for these particular chiral states, what is the, the boundary central charge? Um, this was a calculation that, that Philip and I did um, in the first paper. Um, it turns out that there's a very pretty geometrical interpretation. The boundary central charge um, is the square root of the volume of the primitive cell of this lattice. 
In other words, um, remember I, I said that the more different the left moving and right moving charges, the sparser the lattice, therefore the bigger the, 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 the central charge. Some very simple examples. Suppose um, you just take the normal boundary conditions or the Andreev boundary conditions. Uh, both of those have a central charge equal to one. That's the smallest central charge that, that you can have. Um, however, if you take um, two Dirac fermions um, with uh, a Pythagorean triple, say three and four and five and zero, as the example I used before, um, it turns out the central charge is the square root of the um, uh, larger of those Pythagorean um, triple numbers. So this was um, the formula. Uh, Philip and I thought we were the, the first to, to do this. In, in fact, it was discovered um, uh, somewhat earlier by, by Costas Bacchus, Ilka Brunger, and uh, Röggenkamp in the context of D-brains. Um, th their formula is the formula for the tension of a D-brain in, in string theory, which again is related to this, um, this central charge. It, it, it takes a little bit of effort to show that their formula is the same as our formula, but if, if you work hard enough, the, the, the two are the same. So we weren't really the first to, um, to understand that. All right, so that, that's the first thing. Um, next thing, as I said at the beginning, if you specify um, uh, boundary conditions, um, boundary conditions for fermions fall into one of two classes. Um, the two classes are related to this, this mod 2 anomaly. Um, one way it shows up is that if you put the system on an interval, uh, you're allowed um, uh, to put boundary conditions from the same class on both ends but you're not allowed to put boundary conditions from one class on one end and another class on another end. Because if you do, you end up with these Majorana fermions, which are um, zero modes, which are inconsistent. So the next question to ask is, given um, the charge matrix R, how do you tell which of the two classes it, um, uh, this boundary condition ends up in? Well, um, uh, again, there's a, a calculation you can do. You can ask if you put boundary conditions R on one end and boundary conditions R prime, on the other end, what's the number of ground states that, that the system has? Um, this, I should confess, that this is one of several formulae that feel to me like they're crying out for a deeper explanation that, that I don't have. Um, so we got this formula just by um, doing a detailed calculation. Um, I think it's quite pretty. It's, it's the square root of the volume of the primitive cells of the two charge lattices. And then it's divided by the volume of um, the primitive cell of the intersection of the two lattices. Um, and then there's a, um, uh, a factor here where, where you take the determinant, removing some zero modes of, of the following matrix. So this is the number of ground states. Um, it's not at all obvious that the number of ground states is an integer uh, in, in this system because of all these, these square root factors. And in fact, um, we had to work very hard, this was the main point of this 2019 paper, uh, to show that um, this number here uh, is either an integer or it's the square root of two times an integer. Um, if it's an integer, it's telling you that R and R prime were living in the same uh, class, what our condensed matter friends would call the same SPT class. Um, if it's square root of two times an integer, it's telling you that R and R prime were living in different classes and it's not consistent to put one on one end and one on the other, because the square root of two is characteristic of having an extra Majorana mode, um, uh, zero mode in, in the system. After all, what, what I'm doing here is literally counting the number of ground states of the system. Number of ground states clearly should be an integer. If it's not an integer, there's something wrong. What's wrong is that there was an extra Majorana zero mode, and that was again showing itself up uh, as, as the square root of two. All right, so we have a way to distinguish which, which classes these to uh, two boundary states, R and R prime are in. All right, I, I'm gonna tell you the main part of the talk now, which is what happens when you do RG flows between boundary states. But um, again, I'd be very happy to take any questions if uh, people have them. Denjo, I think, I think you're on mute. I think Marianne has her hand up, or Ma Ma Werner, or maybe oh, that's, that's from earlier. That's gone already. Thanks. Okay. Oh, sorry. Did I did I miss a raised hand? My my, my bad. You no, no, we asked before. Out. Thanks. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. okay. All right. Um, let me tell you about um, uh, what happens if you flow between boundary states. So, so what what's going on here? We we've imposed some 
um, fairly weird boundary conditions uh, on the boundary where left movers and right movers um, carry different charges. Now, the, the, the d equals zero plus one boundary of, um, uh, of this system behaves in many ways like any other quantum field theory. There are operators that you can add to the boundary. And you can classify those operators as being relevant, irrelevant, or marginal, depending on whether their dimension is exactly equal to one, bigger than one, or less than one. One, because one is the space-time dimension of the boundary. Um, what happens if you add an irrelevant operator, just like in quantum field theory, nothing happens at the end of the day, at least for low energy scattering. If you add an operator that's exactly marginal on the boundary, that means has dimension one, um, what it does is it moves you amongst a, a class of boundary conditions, a continuous family of, of boundary conditions. For example, you can change the theta angles in my boundary state by, by doing such a thing. Um, finally, more interesting is what happens if you add a relevant operator on the boundary. If you add a relevant operator, it changes the boundary conditions, um, but doesn't endanger the gapless nature of the massless fermions in, in the bulk. So, so in the bulk, it still remains massless, but a relevant operator just changes the boundary conditions, and you undergo RG flow from one set of boundary conditions down to some other, other set of boundary conditions. Um, generally, it's a hard question about, about what boundary conditions you end up with. Um, for example, the, the condo problem uh, can be solved this way. Of course, it was also solved other ways. The condo problem really becomes a problem of, of you know what happens to the boundary conditions in the, in the uh, UV, but um, where does it flow to in the infrared? In fact, that there are classes of condo problems where the answer to that question uh, still isn't known. All right, there's a lovely result, um, first conjectured by Affleck and Ludwig, and then, and then proven um, uh, more recently, first by Friedan and Konechny, um, that is a, an analog of the C theorem. Under these boundary RG flows, the boundary central charge necessarily decreases. Has to, G, this number G has, has to go down. Um, but by the way, there's a, a very interesting, um, more recent proof of this that uses very different techniques to do with entanglement entropy um, by, by Cassini, Landier, and, and, and Torova. All right, so um, the question is, we have this large class of boundary conditions that all preserve different symmetries. What I want to do is ask, what happens if you perturb them by a relevant operator? Uh, where do you end up? So in other words, I want to start connecting this whole family of different boundary conditions um, through these boundary RG flows. All right, so the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out what, what the, um, uh, the boundary operators are. Um, it turns out you can do that using uh, the state operator map in conformal field theory. You compute the partition function that tells you all the states. The state operator map then um, for boundary conformal field theory tells you what the possible operators on the boundary are. Um, there's a rather nice result. The, the nice result is that the boundary operators are labeled by a charge under the various U1 symmetries. Um, the charge vector rho doesn't sit in that charge lattice lambda, but it sits in the dual lattice. So remember, the more different the left and right moving charges, the sparser the lattice lambda, that means the finer together the dual lattice lambda star is. Okay. Um, given rho, it then determines the dimension and the, the charges under the U1 symmetries of, um, of this operator. Uh, the charges are just related uh, in the following simple way. The dimension is just the length squared to a factor of a half of, um, of, of this lattice vector. Uh, what that means is that the, the relevant operators are those that have dimension less than one. The more different the left and right moving charges, the sparser the lattice lambda, the finer the lattice lambda star, that means there's more rows that are relevant if the left and right moving charges are very different because lambda star is Fine is not quite up. Maybe fine is the right word, but you know, more, more points near the origin. All right, so, so that's the setup. And then the question is the following. You turn on an operator labeled by some charge um, from one bound, set of boundary conditions. Where do you go? That, that was the question we wanted to, to ask. Um, well, firstly, if you turn on an operator labeled by rho, the operator is charged under the U1 symmetries. Uh, if you turn on an operator that's charged under a U1 symmetry, you break the U1 symmetry. So uh, the u1 to the n symmetry gets broken to u1 to the n minus 1. And um, suddenly we're now outside the class of boundary states that, that we, uh, we understand. The only ones we understand are the boundary states that have u1 to the n. So we're going to make the following assumption. And it's not at all obvious that this is, this is right, but I, I hope to convince you over the next few slides that everything works out so nicely that this is surely right. 
Right? You start with a boundary state preserving a u1 to the n symmetry. You break it to u1 to the n minus 1. But where you end up in the infrared is another boundary state with a u1 to the n symmetry. In other words, you have an emergent extra u1 symmetry in, uh, in the infrared. The u1 to the n in the infrared is going to be different from the u1 to the n in the, in the ultraviolet. Um, but nonetheless, there will be a full u1 to the n that's, that's preserved in, in the IR. So that, that's our assumption moving forwards. Um, uh, as I said, I'll, not, I'll never try to convince you this is, um, this is correct. There's a very obvious test. That the test is that where you end up in the IR has to have a boundary central charge that's less than uh, where you started in the UV. Otherwise, the whole thing is, is wrong. And, and it turns out that we do pass that test, um, but just by the skin of our teeth, which sort of makes us feel that, that this assumption is, is most likely right. So what, what's, the, um, what's the situation? Um, well, we've got a u1 to the n symmetry that's broken to u1 to the n minus 1. If in the infrared a u1 to the n is restored, it has to not be anomalous, it has to satisfy that, that Toft anomaly cancellation condition. But the Toft anomaly cancellation condition is a very stringent condition. And in fact, if you have n minus 1 u1 symmetries and you want to add one extra, there's only two possible ways to do it consistent with um, that, that Toft anomaly cancellation condition. One is the thing you started with in the infrared, sorry, in the UV. And the other one is what I've written here in terms of the charge matrix. You basically reflect the charge matrix about the plane perpendicular to this uh, this vector row. So it's, it's quite a nice geometrical construction. Um, given this and the previous result, you might think that the infrared charge, boundary central charge, is just the volume of the primitive cell of this charge matrix, uh, uh, of the lattice associated to this charge matrix. And it turns out that's not correct. Uh, th that's too quick. This is a lower bound, but there are various subtleties that emerge um, that mean that in general, the infrared central charge is uh, can be quite a lot larger than this. So I'll briefly just tell you the subtleties and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the main, um, the main result of our paper. Um, the, the subtleties are the following. Um, you, you could ask, I start that sentence again. Um, all boundary conditions fall into one of two, two classes labeled by this, this SPT phase. And you could ask, if I do an RG flow, is it possible to flow from one class to another class? Now, when we started this, we were pretty sure you couldn't, couldn't do that because it, 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 it seems like it would be inconsistent. You start with two boundary conditions in the same class, and I'll do an RG flow on this one. If it was to flow to a second to the opposite class, I'd end up with a single Majorana fermion, and then the two boundary con conditions are inconsistent. That, that can't possibly be. Nonetheless, if you, if you look at um, uh, our conjecture, it turns out that at least half the time, the boundary condition takes you from one uh, SPT class to the other SPT class. Um, how can that possibly be consistent? Well, the only way it can be consistent um, is if the, the single Majorana zero mode that necessarily emerges has to be accompanied by an extra one. In other words, that somehow the RG flow, and we don't understand how, must dynamically generate an extra Majorana mode to accompany the zero mode that, that appears when you have uh, boundary states of different classes. If you have an extra Majorana mode, the boundary central charge gets multiplied by a square root of two. So in these cases, the central charge is not what we had on the previous slide, it's that multiplied by the square root of two. Um, there's a second uh, caveat that I, I, I won't get into given, given the time. Um, the third caveat uh, is that um, sometimes when you turn on these operators, the U1 to the N is not broken completely, but there's a, um, a ZN um, discrete symmetry that, that survives. It turns out that then one has to sum over images of these, um, uh, these boundary central charges. Again, for string theorists, it's a bit like a, 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 an unstable D-brain decaying into multiple lower dimensional D-brains, which is something that can happen very easily in, in string theory. All right, so there's a whole bunch of caveats that we had to deal with. Um, when the dust settles, um, there's a remarkably simple formula that I would love to understand better. Um, it turns out that um, the infrared central charge and the UV central charge are related by this formula. Um, the infrared central charge is the UV central charge times by the square root of the dimension of the operator that you perturb by. Uh, 
it's such a simple formula and it strikes me as very, very surprising. I, I've never seen anything like this in normal R RG flow. Um, let me point out that um, the operator O is only relevant if its dimension is less than one. Therefore, um, by definition, this, this uh, obeys the, the G theorem. The infrared central charge is always less than, than the UV central charge. Um, the proof of this that, that we have is not elegant in the slightest. The proof in, requires us to figure out all the different caveats, and what happens in every case, and then put them all together, and then miraculously, this is, this is what we get. And yet it's so simple, it has to have a, a, a nice explanation. If anybody has any ideas, I would be very grateful um, uh, for some suggestion on, on how this very simple formula could, um, could possibly emerge. All right, I'm very mindful that I, I've gone way over time already. So I, I think um, given that there is more I can tell you, but I think it's probably best if I, if I stop here and uh, take questions. Um, so thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, uh, David. That was a very nice talk. Uh, I'm sure there may be some questions. Who wants to kick off with a question? Um, I could ask a, a question if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Grant. Um, so within this, uh, these kind of Z8 classifications, you know, there's usually a connection with this um, Atland and Zernbauer kind of class, uh, free firm, classification for free fermions. Is there a way to naturally understand how it might work, at least for the, in this case, for the RG flows? There, there, there is a Z8 classification, which, is, which was <laughs> the next topic on, on my, my slides, but it, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit different. The, the Z8 classification in this case is of um, 2 plus 1 SPT phases, um, fermionic SPT phases, that, that preserve an extra Z2. That, that means that uh, these are boundary conditions um, that preserve uh, fermion number. All boundary conditions preserve fermion number, but individually left and right moving fermion parity. So uh, minus one to the left and minus one to the right are both, both preserved. Um, the, the Z8 classification of, um, say, Fikowski and Kitaev on interacting topological insulators, and, and really the slight rebranding of that result by... Um, Xin Se Ryu and Xiao Ling Qi and, and, and others, um, is a Z8 classification that tells you you should be able to find boundary conditions where both left and right moving fermion parity are preserved, um, but only if you have eight Majorana fermions or a multiple of eight Majorana fermions. Um, it, it's a very striking result, right, for, for boundary conditions, because usually you throw in a left moving fermion or a right moving fermion comes back. So clearly, individually, left moving and right moving fermion parity is not preserve. Um, but remarkably, there are boundary conditions that, that one can write down that preserve both. Uh, the first was written down by Maldacena and Ludwig uh, in 1995, um, before, before Maldacena was, uh, was, was famous. Um, and of course, they didn't know about SPT phases in 1995. They were writing this down for Kalan Rubikov um, reasons. Um, but uh, in, a, in a recent paper, is it Tuesday today? Yeah, in a paper that came out yesterday, um, we, we classified all such um, states that have this property. The, the punchline is that boundary states have this property if this lattice is even. And um, then Philip banged his head against the wall for two months trying to prove that, find out when this lattice can become even, and, and then ultimately found a wonderfully elegant proof involving short exact sequences that, that the lattice can be even if and only if n is... Uh, a multiple of four, n with the number of Dirac fermions, so eight, eight Majorana fermions. So there is a Z8 classification, but it, it's not quite in the, it's not the eightfold way of Outland and, and, and Zernbauer. It's, it's within that eightfold way, there was a Z classification for a particular phase. And when you allow interactions, that Z gets reduced to Z8. And the Z8 can be seen in this particular case um, by, uh, uh, by, by the boundary. Okay. I have two questions. Please. Uh, one is, uh, since you just mentioned Kalin and Rubakov, uh, in, at that time, uh, well, th this was an, an obvious boundary situation for fermions uh, when you looked at, at proton decay. Uh, 
and uh, well, then uh, people got less interested because the magnetic monopoles ha have not been found. Uh, has there been uh, any any new work in this direction? No, but there should have been. Um, there should have been because Callan noticed a puzzle uh, back then that has just been lying uh, unresolved in the literature for, for 40 years. 1985? Uh, yeah, okay, almost uh, 35 years. Um, the, the, the puzzle um, was when he actually looked at the standard model and took into account the fact that the fermions are in chiral representations of the gauge group. And he discovered, he, he worked in the bosonized story, and it, it was slightly weird because it, it, he, he was bosonizing massless fermions, but nonetheless trying to interp interpret kinks as particles, which you should only really do in the massive case. So he, he had some problems, but, but he, he found that um, you threw in a particular fermion from the standard model, and what bounced back was half a fermion. And he got very confused about how half a fermion can, can bounce back. Um, this has mostly been forgotten. Preskill's review on magnetic monopoles mentions this, but, but I haven't really seen any, anything since then. Um, the, the question on how to resolve this, and actually more generally, how you put, um, how you put toft lines, which, which is not a dynamical magnetic monopole, but a sort of, um, you know, the analog of a Wilson line, a, a, a source for a, a mag heavy magnetic monopole, how you put toft lines in a chiral gauge theory in four dimensions. And the question becomes, um, uh, which was actually the very last part of my talk, um, uh, how one imposes uh, boundary conditions for chiral modes, but of a slightly different kind from what I'm talking about here, um, because you need to in include the, the rotational symmetry. So um, there's an open puzzle, which is what Callan uh, raised 35 years ago and no one has solved, um, which ultimately is how do you think about monopoles in chiral gauge theories? Um, and how fermions scatter off them. Um, I, I would love to know the answer to this. I've been thinking about this for two or three years on and off and, and, and I've been unable uh, to solve it. So no, there hasn't been any progress, but there should have been. And I would love it if, some, if, if there was. Uh, second question, uh, since you mentioned the work of, of three of my students, uh, there was th something they always told me and I never was quite able to visualize uh, about the RG flow that uh, you start uh, from a simple irreducible representation and then you move into a direct sum. So you, you mentioned that you, you have multiple uh, boundary conditions at, at the other end. Yeah. And I never was quite able to, to visualize that. Uh, do, do you have some, some way you, uh, good way to think about that? I, I do actually. Um, t t take a torus and put a D string on the torus. Um, put the D string so that it winds P times around one cycle and Q times around the other. Okay. And make it an unstable D string so, so that it, it can decay somewhere. Um, it's possible for that, that to decay to a D string that just wraps P times around, around one cycle. Um, or equivalently, P D strings wrapping around one cycle. So it's one D string that can decay into P D strings. Of course, the, the total length of, of those is, is smaller than, than the original one. So energetically, it's allowed. Um, that, that's the statement that the central charge goes down. But nonetheless, um, yeah, one D string can decay into many in, in that one. Thank you. Who were your three students, by the way? Inka Pruner, Daniel Rockenkamp, and Andreas Regnagel. Oh, you mentioned all I, I, I was unaware. Okay, that's an impressive group. <laughs> um, other questions? Uh, I have questions. Uh, yes, please. I, a very nice talk. So um, I was wondering, so um, what are, so the role of, for instance, of crystalline symmetries in your story? You suppose that your uh, SPT has also, let's say, mirrored symmetries or rotational symmetry S C N. So there is any, I mean, uh, you know, also this Z8 classification also is based on some, uh, yeah, these are SPT, but I mean, I, I can also build this uh, Z8 classification with uh, imposing some crystalline symmetries my, to the system. Yeah, e even in the usual eightfold way, the, the crystalline symmetry is, 
all, almost not there, right? You, it's, it, there's really, there's this tenfold classification. Yeah, and, and yeah, you get but to pick, you expand the further. That's the yeah, point. Yeah, so you get to pick charge conjugation. Yes, and or no, where yes is plus or minus one, and the same for time reversal. That gives you nine, and then there's just one extra one. And, and the, the crystalline symmetry is only in that one extra one where, where there's no, no symmetries at all. Where, well, uh, it's basically fixed by CPT. Um, yeah, no, no, you're right completely. The 10 families are just 10 by these three symmetries, but then people have expanded, you know, they've used also K theory on the other more mathematical approach to expand this family to 20 or something like that. And, Still, uh, you know, we can still get uh, in condensed matter Dirac fermions on the boundary of 2D system. And uh, for instance, you, you can, some mirror symmetry can allow to have uh, eight uh, Dirac fermions only if, because they can satisfy certain symmetry and they can be broken if you don't, we don't pick up eight, but you know, seven or five. And it's also related to another point that, uh, uh, I mean, okay, uh, I did, um, you didn't finish, so in this uh, two, in two plus one dimension, we can see the Dirac uh, or Majorana as the boundary, right? But actually now there are systems where we can start from three plus one, and then we look at the boundary of the boundary. And then we have the one plus one Dirac fermions. These are the higher order topological insulators. So in these families, we still, so the, the crystalline symmetry play a very important role. So, so many people now in condensed matter are looking at this uh, boundary of boundary is the general single boundary. So I was just wondering if you can extend your uh, idea of uh, you know, boundary condition by taking into account also these crystalline symmetries. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a famous equation, which is d squared is zero, the boundary the boundary vanishes. Yeah, uh, well, point, yeah, right. Point, you mean an edge, is that, is that it's not really yeah, a, no, for instance, suppose that you have a, um, suppose that you have a square. So it's uh, your, your, material is a square and now usually if this is a topological insulator you would have uh, uh, let's say chiral or, or helical edge modes okay but then uh, adding further symmetry then these edge modes are leaves only on the four corners so you basically you gap everything so your bulk is gapped your edge are gapped and only the zero modes are in the corners but that, that's not that's not topology that's geometry no, 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 no. This is a second order topological insulator. It's still topological. So it's possible to prove that uh, there are underlying topological invariants behind I, I thought topologically the edge of a square was the same as a circle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, it's a different kind of topology. Uh, but, uh, I, I don't, I mean, it does sound like it's something where the lattice is, is important. Yeah, no, the, the lattice is crucial. Yeah, yeah. I, of course, you are right. In the continuum, we cannot distinguish. So it's really related to the lattice structure. Even if I take the 3D cubic lattice, instead to have uh, uh, 2D surface states, I have uh, corners or edge states in 1D. So I can really get the, your 1 plus 1 theory on the boundary of a 3 plus 1 uh, cubic lattice system, basically. And this the, is really lattice stuff. But the, I would the, just the formula, want to... You know, boundary squared is, is zero actually plays an important role here. So if you start with a 2 plus 1 dimensional SPT, Phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then, then I, I, I'll consider my um, uh, my fermions to be on the on the edge of that, so, so yeah, they yeah. themselves live live on the boundary. That that means that it, it shouldn't be possible to um, put a boundary on my fermions, uh, preserving you know, symmetries if my fermions were, were themselves realized on. Um, exactly, exactly. And in, in fact, that, that's exactly what we see, that this ZH classification where you want to preserve left and right moving fermion parity, it can only happen when there's eight of them, because if there's, you know, if it's not a multiple of eight, um, then my fermions were on the edge. Uh, okay, yes, yes. Two plus one system and the boundary of the boundary can't, can't exist. Because of, yeah, what you mentioned the Jackie Rebbe, basically these corner states are just the Jackie Rebbe on, on, on really on, on a square, basically. So you, really you, might, you must have a sort of state and anti-state so that when the square becomes a circle, they, they, they lift. Yeah, yeah, of course. When they, we smooth out uh, everything, they disappear. So it's really geometric. It's deep, so it's a mixture of geometry and topology. So if there is the right geometry, then there is a topological invariant with, uh, and the bulk edge correspondence is generalized, but it's, uh, it's, it's a new family of things, of uh, materials. Okay. Okay. Um.
I think if there are no further questions, we will. Uh, I'm going to stop recording, and uh, we can thank uh, uh, David again. Okay, thank you.